And welcome back to the Glenn Gerberg Weather and Climate Summit. I'm meteorologist Dave Jones with Storm Center Communications. And I'm sitting here with uh, Dr. Howie Bluestein from University of Oklahoma uh, and uh, Paul Cosen, who works at the National Weather Service and the Weather Prediction Center. Uh, Paul spoke this morning on forecasting winter weather, the challenges uh, that are ahead and the improvements that have been made, and uh, how he spoke about tornado research and some of the latest uh, observations he's been making with radars, uh, especially over the last year to two years because it's been such an upswing in intense uh, tornadic activity. So part of this conference is uh, really one of uh, the most fun because it opens the doors to you, uh, the Internet viewers who are not able to uh, join in person out here in Breckenridge, but can participate online live. And we know there is a lot of chatter and discussion uh, between uh, the speakers this morning and also a lot of questions. And so we want to open the doors up. Uh, initially, we, we just go as long as the questions are, are there. So if uh, you have or more questions as you hear uh, Howie speak and Paul speak, then you can ask additional questions. Sarah Maxwell is a meteorologist and our social media producer uh, that is taking your questions, and I'll walk the microphone over to her. Uh, actually, I'll do that right now uh, so we can get started with the questions, and uh, we're keeping it uh, quite informal. So, you know, it's really a discussion back and forth uh, between uh, Howie and Paul and you watching through the Internet. So with that, we'll get started with the first question. Sarah. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, the first question is going to be for Paul Kosin, and this comes from somebody uh, who, in this room, you'll recognize the name and probably some of our online audience as well. It's Joe Witte. And uh, Joe, Paul would like you to address, uh, explain the polar vortex and stratosphere versus the polar high troposphere. And he says, take a ski run for me. <laughs> so that's from Joe. Do you want to talk a little bit about the polar vortex? You know, I thought I would get through this whole thing <laughs> without mention of that, but I'll give it a shot. You know, I really did avoid that. Um, the polar vortex has been a terminology that meteorologists have been using, as Joe knows this all the well. Um, we've been using that for years to describe basically what normally happens up at the poles. They get a upper low, it's associated with very cold temperatures, and it tends to move about a bit. And during the winter time, there are little bits and pieces of it that come south, and sometimes we see larger bits and pieces. And this one particular cold wave we had is what we called, oh, it looks like the polar vortex is coming down, meaning that just a very large chunk of what's typically very cold air just comes into the United States. Um, it used to happen very, very frequently. It doesn't quite happen so much anymore. Um, we saw a bunch of low, low temperature records, and um, that's what we see. Thank you, Paul. Um, Howie, this one is for you. Uh, Lagrange, am I pronouncing that correctly? 2009 showed uh, microscale surface boundaries affected path of tornado. How often are these boundaries and interactions observed? Uh, the uh, supercells sometimes interact with with uh, low-level boundaries, outflow boundaries, fronts, boundaries of, of unknown of, uh, of unknown origin. And uh, we know that they do have uh, some influence on supercell behavior. Um, to some extent, uh, horizontal rotation, horizontal vorticity may be produced along the edge of outflow boundaries, and air having that type of rotation, vorticity, may get injected into the supercell and affect its behavior. Uh, we know that supercells, as they cross boundaries, say from a warm boundary to a cool boundary, may change their behavior because the air that's going into the updraft is cooler, and therefore uh, 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 you can realize less convective available potential energy. And so the updraft will, will go down in intensity. Um, so we understand some of the basic physical mechanisms uh, that, that might change the behavior of supercells. But I think it's very, very difficult to, to, to uh, predict these sorts of interactions, uh, in large part because we don't have good enough data to really map out all the uh, surface boundaries that are out there. Great, thank you. Uh, Paul, this one is for you. Do you believe that snowfall uh, will increase in a warmer, warmer world for certain regions? 
Uh, <clears throat> for certain regions, I think the answer is yes. Because uh, the um, belief the, is that as the world warms, there'll be more moisture. And if you're still cold, which will still be occurring, uh, that could lead to heavier snows, and et cetera. Um, in the areas where it's more transitional, where you get some snow one year, very little the other, it may work the opposite way. Uh, but in general, I think a warmer world, cold places stay snowy, warmer places, not so much. Great. Um, and Howie, um, this might actually expand to some of the Weather Service folks in the room if you would like to pull them in. What are some of the things that would make tornado warnings more accurate? Uh, because many people ignore warnings due to the amount of false alarms. Do you want to address that? Well, that's a difficult question. I mean, the question really is how can we improve the, the accuracy of tornado warnings so that when one is issued, people will think that they're not going to have a false uh, uh, it's, it's not a, 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 uh, a bad uh, warning and that they really do need to take cover. Uh, I think that uh, a number of ways this can be done. Uh, the Doppler radar does a very good job of showing us where tornadoes are. Spotters in the field tell us uh, where tornadoes are. And uh, also numerical modeling, uh, numerical models that can assimilate real-time data that can try to predict the future behavior of storms. Uh, will hopefully also uh, improve uh, the, our ability to, uh, to uh, give warnings, more accurate warnings. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and Paul, I have another one for you. Are you familiar with the work of Jennifer Francis from Rutgers? And if so, um, how, what is your opinion on her theories and how they affect our winter weather patterns? This is an easy one. No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> if you are interested, uh, she was here last year, is that correct? And her, her, uh, her talk from last year is on our YouTube page, if our online audience would like to go to, uh, to our YouTube page. And all of the videos, I'm going to plug this real quick, um, that we're having this week, all of the speakers and uh, their talks will be available via YouTube through our website, and we'll be tweeting more about that. And this is Dave Jones. I just wanted to make the comment from Jennifer Francis's uh, research that she's been doing is showing some correlation between the uh, melting Arctic ice, uh, the diminishing amount of Arctic ice, and how it's affecting the jet stream. Uh, and she's showing some correlation between them where the jet stream is becoming weaker and allowing it to become wavier. And so you create more opportunities for uh, rapidly deepening, uh, you know, uh, mid-latitude cyclones, blocking, and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, so maybe that's a discussion we can have this time next year, or uh, pick it up, you know, on some uh, some discussion uh, through the Weather and Climate Summit website. Okay. Um, Sarah is uh, looking at the social media and the input for uh, questions. I I also had one, which was uh, uh, for you, Howie in uh, talking about um, tornado chasing. And uh, just if you could, you know, tell us some more about your thoughts. And, and uh, you, you know, we know we can't stop everybody from chasing. Uh, but is there, is there an approach that we can use to really uh, maybe deliver some of this <laughs> video back to people so they can uh, look at it and they don't have to go out and chase and get in the way of all these uh, people that are either trying to get out of the way of the storm or folks like yourselves that have the, the credibility and the equipment to measure the vortices and the winds and all that sort of stuff. How, how can we start more of a, a dialogue in the Midwest to say what's the best approach to handle the chasing of storms? Well, I think that uh, somehow we need to convince people that storm chasing is just not like fishing. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a simple hobby that it is dangerous, and uh, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, or even if you know what you're doing, uh, that you can possibly get yourself into a, a position where you're in a lot of danger. I think the main thing to do is to educate people that this is dangerous and that maybe you don't want to, to do it. I think that uh, making videos, tornado videos available to people will probably stoke the fire, stoke the flames uh, even more and that people will even more want to go out and, and see a, a tornado. The cat's out of the bag, and uh, once storm chasing became very, very popular, 
uh, we saw an explosion in the number of uh, people who are going out in storm chase, to storm chase. Uh, I think that we somehow need to educate the public that this is not for everyone and that perhaps you shouldn't be doing this. And I had uh, one other question here on, on my uh, Facebook page that somebody asked that said, how does, uh, how does the University of Oklahoma, with the research that you're doing in tornadoes, how do you guys work with the National Weather Service? Um, do you d stick to research and publish papers, or do you work with them uh, closely to determine things? We try to do everything. Remember that, that many of the people who work for the National Weather Service downstairs are some of our students or former students. Um, we do work with the Weather Service. Uh, our main focus is on research, but we hope that our research can be applied. Uh, when we go out and see a tornado, if we have the time, uh, and if there are a few people out there, we will uh, call or text the National Weather Service to let them know that we're seeing a tornado as confirmation to, to aid in their real-time warnings. Uh, after the fact, we have worked with personnel from the National Weather Service uh, to discuss where a tornado went. We might compare our uh, Doppler radar, mobile Doppler radar data with the damage surveys done by the National Weather Service. So there is quite a bit of interaction between us uh, and the National Weather Service and the, the Storm Prediction Center also. That sounds great. This question is for Paul. Um, Paul, do you think that we'll see a time where we can close schools well before a storm hits consistently when it comes to snowstorms? Is modeling uh, getting better where we can do that? Uh, I can always answer for all the school children in the country and say yes, of course. Um, with everything else, there will be improvements made, but at the way things are going right now, uh, I think still think there's enough uncertainty with the forecasts that um, we'll still probably only have these cancellations done immediately beforehand. So for the foreseeable future, that could also change. Uh, Paul, I have another one that's come in on our stream. Uh, could you comment on the significant ice events this year? Specifically, how well have they been forecast and what, if any, improvements can be made for the ice forecast? Well, ice forecasts have always been challenging in that anywhere where we're seeing transition between snow, freezing rain and sleet, and just plain rain is, is often fraught with peril. Um, we can often have a much easier time when we're seeing just snow, just rain, uh, but the models that we use still have difficulties in sort of pinpointing exactly where those temperature profiles conducive for freezing rain, which become ice storms, are considered. Uh, also, another problem with freezing rain is that sometimes you only need a trace of precipitation to cause a problem, where the more dangerous forms of ice storms, where you get a lot of loading of ice on trees, that's another issue. But the ones that are very difficult to forecast, and probably still are, are where temperature's very cold, but it doesn't require much moisture. And um, we still have some problem. The larger scale events, I think in general, are predicted pretty well, probably no better or worse uh, than most winter storms, snowstorms that you see. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I have a new one for Howie. Um, Howie, do you have any opinion on the work by Elsner showing trends in tornado occurrence, uh, such as what was presented at AGU 2013? Okay. I, I I know a little bit about Jim Elsner's work, but I'm not really terribly familiar with it. But um, I'm uh, very wary of looking at a, a record of a data set that's relatively short and in making predictions about long-term trends. So for example, uh, if we have very good data on radar, if we have very good data on tornado occurrence, say only for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, uh, and there are changes going on uh, in, in, in decades or 50 years or 100 years, I'm very, very, very wary of, of extrapolating. Uh, Jim is a much better statistician than I am, so I would have to defer to his judgment on the statistical uh, 
uh, robustness of, of his techniques, though. Uh, Paul, I'm just going to give you an opportunity for my own interest. If you want to talk about, you said you're working on a, a third book on northeastern snowstorms. Could you talk a little bit about the changes that you've noticed from the first edition to the second and now to the third? Um, good question. <laughs> um, the changes that are occurring are still relatively subtle, and there were things we were already beginning to see in the late part of the 20th century, including the March 93 superstorm. And that was that some of these winter storms seemed to be a little larger, a little more widespread. Snowfall amounts seemed to be a little greater than for equivalent events that we were seeing further back into the 20th century. So some of the cases we're seeing, including President's Day 2 in February 2003, the fact that New York City now has their new snowfall record in, in another storm, and other storms just seem to have a little bit more punch um, in terms of snowfall distribution and some of the highest amounts. Whether that's a function of measurements have changed, people have changed, we don't really know, but it's, it's something we've ob observed. Um, this question is, uh, is kind of similar It's uh, to, to both uh, Howie and Paul, and that is, have you guys seen in your research, and I know, Howie, you do much more mesoscale type uh, research, but have you noticed a change in the size of synoptic scale systems? For example, low pressure systems covering larger areas or high pressure systems being more dominant and larger um, as uh, the last couple of decades have, have uh, moved forward. Um, I ask this because I've spoken with some synoptic meteorologists and forecasters that say, you know, these systems seem larger. They seem to be dominating a larger area of the country when they develop. Is there anything to that, or is it just um, it happens sometimes? I guess I'll, I'll start just in saying that actually is not really my experience in terms of seeing systems physically being larger. I see weather systems like the weather systems like the cold weather system we just saw being less frequent uh, than when I grew up and I think Greg Corbin just did a great little graphic um, showing all of these great cold outbreaks we've had over the past 114 years and um, you know this this one we just had would not have been such a big deal back in the 80s and 90s but was actually the first one of its magnitude probably in the last uh, 18 years. Uh, I really can't answer that question, and I haven't noticed uh, any changes, but I can offer some comments about what I would do, what one possibly could do to try to see whether to test this, uh, these ideas. Uh, when you talk about the size of a, of a system, uh, two things. One, you can talk about the wavelength from ridge to ridge or from trough to trough. And uh, uh, this, is, this wavelength is governed by several things, uh, one of which is the north-south temperature gradient, the amount of baroclinicity in the atmosphere, and the other is the static stability, the way the temperature varies in the vertical. This is well known from classical baroclinic instability theory. So we could go ahead and, and, and make some guess about what changes there might be if the baroclinicity is changing and if the uh, static stability is changing. The other is uh, we might ask the question, uh, what is the radius of winds having a, a value exceeding a certain uh, uh, limit in cyclones and going ahead and seeing what that is for every cyclone there is out there uh, and, and calculate that for different regions of the earth as a function of time. We could do something similar for ridges. We'd have to come up with an objective measurement and then see how that changes over time. But subjectively, it's extremely difficult, I think, to say that it seems as if cyclones are getting bigger or anti-cyclones are getting larger. Uh, you really need to make that uh, a lot more quantitative. And there could be several events, uh, outliers, where you have a very, very large, intense cyclone. And uh, it may seem to you, therefore, from that one big case that, yes, cyclones are getting bigger. So we really don't know. But we could, we could certainly learn.
So um, to wrap up, because this is the Weather and Climate Summit, um, we would like to, for each of you to have an opportunity to talk about how, if anything, you see as far as climate trends um, in relation to the amount of severe weather or winter weather that we're having. Um, how would global warming uh, affect the distribution of tornadoes, frequency and occurrence of tornadoes? We don't know the answer to that, uh, but we can make several comments. Uh, first of all, um, as the atmosphere warms up, there will be more water vapor available. And on the face of that, you might argue that, well, there might be more storms. There's, there's more energy for the storms. And uh, perhaps the tornado frequency would go up. On the other hand, uh, as the atmosphere warms up, it's quite possible that the camping inversion might uh, increase in intensity. So there might be, uh, while there might be more cape available, it's possible that there'll be fewer storms actually triggered. Uh, as we get into a, a, a global warming climate, it might be that the north-south barochronicity, the north-south temperature gradient, decreases. In that case, there might be uh, less vertical wind shear available for supercells. Well, that might be nice, but as Rush Schneider showed the other day, you can still get some pretty intense tornadoes, even on days when the barochronicity, when the vertical wind shear, is not all that great. Uh, my best guess would be that the tornadoes, uh, that the frequency of occurrence and distribution would change uh, for different parts of the country and different parts of the world in ways that I absolutely cannot right now quantify. I guess in the same light and basically for the same line of reasoning, uh, the same is sort of true for winter storms as well. Um, I gave an answer before that said that in general, um, we can expect to see places that are used to seeing snow, see more snow as the atmosphere is more able to take up water vapor. But at the same time, places that don't get a lot of snow could see the opposite, uh, which would be kind of um, you know, logical reasoning. But there's all sorts of secondary effects, um, especially studies that are showing that the potential for larger and more intense storms could bring uh, more significant s snow when it does occur um, to um, you know, other secondary effects that, as Howie basically said, we can't really foresee now. So uh, the future, there will be changes in winter storms as well. Um, it's not easy to foresee specifically what those effects will be. for uh, taking the time to come back and talk to the internet viewers and for you to uh, that are watching on television and your computer to, for asking those questions let's take a look outside live as we have for the last uh, couple times still snowing it's still snowing outside this is a live look here in Breckenridge look at that <laughs> don't expect any melting anytime soon and I do want to remind everybody that is watching right now that tomorrow uh, our first speaker is Dr. Richard Nabb uh, Rick is the director of the National Hurricane Center in Miami, and uh, he will be uh, talking uh, for the first session tomorrow. And then after uh, Rick speaks, uh, we're going to be talk, uh, having a talk from Dan Bailey. Excuse me. And he's going to be. Um, oh. Okay. Now I'm back, <laughs> and now you can hear me. <laughs> this is still a live look outside in Breckenridge where it's snowing. Uh, tomorrow morning, I just wanted to remind you of the session. Uh, the first session will be Dr. Rick Nabb, who is the director of the National Hurricane Center. And after uh, Rick speaks, uh, we'll have a break, and then we'll have Dan Bailey, who's the president and chairman of the uh, board on International Association of Wildland Fire. Uh, Dan is going to be talking about living on the edge, uh, the uh, interface between the urban and wildland fire uh, system. And we're seeing a lot more... Uh, wildfires that are affecting people uh, that live near uh, forests and even in urban areas. So this is going to be a very interesting talk. As we evolve the climate talks uh, tomorrow after Rick Nabb speaks, and then on Friday, uh, Thursday we'll hear from uh, Dr. Wayne Higgins, who is the director of NOAA's Climate Program Office. And following that, Ned Gardner will speak for about 30 minutes 
on various content that you can get from the Climate Program Office's website, climate.gov. And then after uh, Ned speaks, we'll have Dr. Jim White from the University of Colorado. He will speak on abrupt climate change. So thank you once again for joining us this afternoon for this live Q&A session. We'll do this each day with the morning speakers. And thank you once again for participating. We'll see you back here again tomorrow morning at uh, 8 o'clock a.m. Mountain Time. So thanks again for joining us at the Glenn Gerberg Weather and Climate Summit.